Well, welcome everyone. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the adult programs coordinator for the VMFA and I get to work with wonderful people like my colleague Trent Nicholas this morning to talk about um, surrealism, specifically how it connects to our current special exhibition on view, um, the artist Man Ray. So that'll be kind of um, added into this month's program. So Trent, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Izzy, for that cue. You'll probably have to give me a lot of cues through this. Um, yeah, I'm kind of filling in for Jeffrey Allison. He's very sorry he can't be here. Something called him away and he kind of handed the baton to me and I'll try to fill his shoes, which will be very difficult. Uh, but three and 30, it's three objects in the Virginia Museum in 30 minutes. And uh, I'm using our featured player, Man Ray, as one object, kind of. He kind of combines into an object. And then I'll use Andre Masson, whose uh, work hangs in the French modernist gallery just off the atrium at the museum. And uh, a fellow that some of you may have heard of, Salvador Dali, who we do have a piece in that French modernist uh, gallery also. Now, um, Man Ray and Surrealism, that's what the talk's called, and uh, Surrealism, that word has dropped a whole lot uh, in this because we've got the big Man Ray exhibition, and it has to be kept in mind that he started out as a, a Dadaist, and we'll talk about Dada. I'm just going to give you a little overview here. Everyone wants to know where did the word surreal come from? Well, it's probably was used through uh, the French world for one thing or another, but um, we can trace it to Apollinaire when it first uh, had took on some of the meanings we think of today with um, the uh, irrational aspects of surrealism and the so real that it's past being real uh, with the Apollinaire in a, a play he wrote in 1917, but he didn't coalesce it into a movement and it took Andre Breton to, to claim that uh, word and he wrote the manifestos of surrealism in 1924. Now, here are a couple of quick um, definitions of surrealism as Breton saw, saw, uh, saw it. Uh, to resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into an absolute reality, a super reality, or a surreality. And also, it's pure psychic automatism by which one intends to express verbally and writing by another method the functioning of the mind, dictation of thought, the absence of any control exercised by reason beyond any aesthetic concern. Now, I know that's cleared up that word for you, surrealism. Well, uh, to put it in brief, to sum it up, uh, it's uh, an art form depending on the uh, logic of dreams, of course, uh, and Breton uh, was enamored with the theories of Freud, but he was also very much a Marxist and uh, for the world people's revolution, the workers' revolution, and supported the big Russian revolution in uh, what became the USSR in 1917 and uh, supported Vladimir Lenin, uh, all the theories of Karl Marx and of Trotsky. Uh, Trotsky being the sort of the big, became to be the big rival to Joseph Stalin and Breton um, condemned Joseph Stalin and uh, all that went with it, the Stalinism going on in the USSR, which was repressive. And in fact, uh, Stalin uh, condemned surrealism. Stalin was uh, of the thought that people didn't understand surrealism as a bunch of weirdos doing it. And really, Breton's aim was to spread the communist revolution around the world. Now, that's a, a big fact that's often forgotten, and you cannot discuss surrealism without keeping that in mind, the politics of it all. Now, Man Ray, uh, he aligned himself with the Dadaists originally while he was still in the United States. I think most of you may know that he was born in New York City and um, was in this country through his young manhood until uh, 
1921. He was born in 1890, so he moved to Paris when he was about 31 years old. Now he took up with Dada. He was a painter. He was known as a painter at first in New York, um, sort of learning his trade, you might say. He wasn't a big, big name, but he was enamored with the 1913 Armory Show in New York City and uh, met Duchamp somewhere along the line, Marcel Duchamp. And um, Duchamp actually moved to New York City in 1915. So he and Man Ray hung out in New York City. Uh, he, Man Ray was, uh, you might say, a Renaissance man of Dada and surrealism. He could kind of do it all. He, he had his sculptures. We know this piece, which is a very classically Dada piece, Dada uh, taking the um, objects of everyday life and turning them into something subversive or uh, just trying to expand the range of art to things that aren't necessarily lovely or pretty. And this was a reaction to World War I, that if a rational state of mind had created World War I, then um, irrationality must be the way to go. And um, Dada was totally nihilistic. It had no real solid political viewpoint, uh, or so it claimed. Um, it uh, dwelt on the object, as we see the object, here's the iron, and uh, used no narrative in its productions. Um, uh, it's anti-story, you might say. You don't, don't look at a Dada painting or film and think there's some kind of story. They're supposedly not. And even the human body was turned into object and um, used as a thing rather than as humans. Uh, Man Ray, uh, with the flow of the way things were going after 1921 in Paris, where he moved, he aligned himself with the Dadas there and the, then eventually the Surrealists. He and Breton, um, of course, were uh, colleagues in all of that. And he followed a lot of Breton's uh, philosophies. Man Ray wasn't, though, as overtly communistic, though he did seem to support all of that. Uh, he wasn't a firebrand as much as the Breton was. And this seemed to be a trend in surrealism through its history is which artists were more uh, vociferous or more uh, zealously communistic and for the world worker revolution and those who weren't, that created rifts in the Surrealist movement. Now, um, I'm going to talk about this painting. Also, André Masson, who, as I mentioned, it's in the French Modernist Gallery off of the atrium at the museum. You can see it next time you go there. You may already have seen it. Uh, Masson was very much a surrealist and politically so, a communist, and uh, followed Breton's uh, path also. But interestingly enough, uh, as I said, was sort of habitual throughout the history of surrealism, artists dropped in and out um, because of the level or how much immersion they could make in this uh, revolutionary approach and um, how uh, strictly communistic they were. And Masson had a rift with uh, Breton and in 1929 and dropped out of the surrealist group. But he joined back up uh, in the late 1930s and he and Breton continued to be on good terms. It's just that, as I said, it's uh, to what degree were you political? To what degree were you a communist? Uh, and uh, how long would that keep you aligned with the surrealists? Nonetheless, Masson used a surrealist method of drawing and painting, which was automatic. And automatic is pulling out the uh, depths of your subconscious without any um, rational and conscious censorship. And uh, what that involved, certainly in the case of Masson, was to create um, faces and objects and people and um, recognizable representations 
somewhat in what appeared to be random lines and brush strokes and uh, materials added to his paintings. And uh, you can see this painting here appears to be amorphic shapes, but he has turned a number of them into what appear to be faces, body parts, uh, maybe uh, objects of nature. Uh, and um, he's also, manipulated the canvas quite a bit. He's uh, cut out uh, um, paper and uh, glued it on. And he has even uh, poured sand into the wet paint. And you can see the sand on the paint. Can't really make it out here in this image. But if you go see the painting in the gallery, you can see the sand that is embedded into the paint. And uh, Masson was in World War I, and Dada, as I believe I mentioned, was a reaction to World War I. And Masson was critically wounded in World War I. And the, uh, he survived, of course, and the images he saw stayed with him the rest of his life. And he found the automatic approach to drawing and painting uh, in the surrealistic manner, a little bit restrictive and eventually expanded it to doing uh, paintings and drawings that look automatic or random, um, but he manipulated them into a um, premeditated subject matter. And a lot of times that was the horrors of war and horrific images that uh, stayed in his mind the rest of his life. Uh, by the way, Masson, like a lot of the Surrealists, immigrated over to the United States around 1940 to escape the uh, what seemed to be the certain uh, invasion of Nazi Germany and taking over Paris, because any Surrealists would have been in big trouble if the Nazis uh, found them. And so a lot of them went over to the the United States, some ending up in New York City. Masson continued his relationship with Breton in um, New York. And actually, Masson stayed in the United States. And Breton went back to Europe but um, after the war. But Masson um, settled in Connecticut. And uh, even Salvador Dali went over to the United States and uh, eventually went back to Spain, where he was from. Um, okay, and speaking of Dali, we've got this painting in the French Modernist Gallery, and Dali was perhaps, in my opinion, I think this can be backed up, he was uh, the um, most masterful painter, at least handling the brush and the paints. He could, uh, certainly if he had lived in the Renaissance, he would have been up to those standards of Renaissance painting. And you see in this God of the Bay of Roses uh, images that certainly remind you of what you might see in some Renaissance painting. It's also got uh, trademark Dali amorphic images. Remember the amorphic images in Masson, which truly are. And Dali sort of created an amorphic image deliberately. Instead of finding it in the paint, he creates it, uh, such as what appears to be a rock structure. But you certainly can look into it, and you, uh, you feel like you're seeing something within this rock structure that may or may not be there. Same with clouds. Just as we look up at clouds uh, in the sky and see uh, things our imagination brings to us in the clouds. Dali can provide those amorphic shapes to you in his paintings. And he does indeed include clouds a lot. You think of Dali also of the melting clocks and watches. Uh, we don't see that in this painting, but you can imagine them in here. And uh, he created the most recognizable surrealistic image in history with those uh, drooping, um, impotent clock, you might say. Uh, this, his wife, he used his wife's image in many of his paintings. This is Gala, G-A-L-A, -A, his wife. Um, well, yes, he's kind of made her rather um, transgender there. And um, 
Dali, though, was tenuously a surrealist. He started out that way, but he wasn't so sure he was much of a communist. And uh, he, I can just imagine Dali saying, I'm a capitalist. I want to make a lot of money. I'm going to be a celebrity. And he proceeded to make himself a major celebrity. Of course, you can't do that unless you've got a lot of substance to back it up. And he's had uh, one of the most amazing minds in the creative arts. And, and this is why he is identified with surrealism more than any other painter, though they kicked him out. He quit. They kicked him out again. He quit. He joined. There was a lot of that stuff going on. But Dali was most despised by Breton eventually for his flirtations with fascism. Dali kind of uh, suggested that maybe Hitler was a positive force in Germany. And Dali was somewhat for the um, Francisco Franco in Spain. Uh, Dali never fully committed to, to those or to fascism, and I think he learned the error of his way, but he was um, certainly had some flirtations with it in the 30s, but that was not that uncommon. Uh, a lot of people saw Hitler's bringing dignity back to Germany, blah, 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 but we knew that didn't come about anyway. Uh, Dali lived in the United States, also fled, as I mentioned, he fled uh, France and, uh, to avoid World War II. He actually had, uh, was in Bowling Green, Virginia, lived over there, up there, about an hour away with uh, very wealthy benefactors. He even designed a monument for monument Avenue, which I'm still waiting for someone to suggest that we do build that Dali monument there on Monument Avenue. Uh, just like Man Ray, Dali was also a filmmaker, not as much as Man Ray. Dali made two infamous movies, Ushan Andalou and Laos Door with Louis Bunuel. Bunuel went on to become the major filmmaker of surrealism and Dali concentrated on his other works of art, objects, uh, painting, sculpture, even jewelry. The Dali jewel, jewels are amazing. And the Virginia Museum uh, displayed the Dali jewels for seven, several years back in the 1970s. I wish we could have kept those. By the way, I, I just throw this in. I work in the statewide department with Jeffrey Allison. We reach out to the state. And as I mentioned, Man Ray was a filmmaker. We will have a Man Ray film night on February 11th with Dr. Michael Taylor speaking, the curator and uh, uh, director of education and, uh, uh, of the, uh, and head curator of the arts here and the man who curated the Man Ray exhibition. A um, little tidbit, by the way, Man Ray is often called a pseudonym, and it might fall into that category, but it's really very much his real name. It's pretty darn close. He was born uh, Emmanuel Radzinski. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. His family changed their last name to Ray from Radzinski. Um, and that was, of course, in New York uh, to reduce uh, some unfortunate anti-Semitism towards them. And his first name, Emmanuel, was shortened to Manny. So he was Manny Ray. And when he went to Paris, he just called himself Man Ray. So it's pretty close to his actual name. Um, I wanted to show you his sculpture, by the way. Uh, I'm sorry, his monument for Monument um, Avenue. Uh, do you think that'll get built? I, I, I don't know if it will, but um, it also has some kind of Confederate connection. So that will really rule it out. But I don't think Dali really understood anything about Confederacy. I think he was just trying to satisfy the people of Virginia then. But more so than that, it comes from the Reynolds aluminum logo. If 
you look at the uh, old Reynolds aluminum foil logo, there's a uh, knight slaying a dragon. And uh, that's where Dolly got that because the Reynolds, there was a member of the Reynolds family who also was one of his benefactors. How am I on time? Is he, am I doing okay? Hey Trent, um, I'm so glad you brought up that image because that was one of my uh, questions for you. Um, we do have just about um, eight minutes left in our 30 minute okay. um, program. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to send them in. But I had a couple of my own. First, I'm so glad you had that sketch. That's amazing. Um, is that something like, where did you find that? Was that in like the Valentine's records or oh, oh, I just never I, heard I, that? I inherited it from Jeffrey. Jeffrey found it somewhere. He dug it up. So I can't take credit for uh, finding it. But I had seen it before. You know, there's a fellow in town, Harry Kolatz, who wrote a, a play about Dali uh, in Richmond with the Reynolds, uh, the family member of the Reynolds. And uh, this image actually floated around a lot at that time. That was about, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. Harry Kolatz writes for Richmond Magazine. Anybody can write, email Harry, and he'll, he'll give you a lot of information about all this. Oh, that's great. Uh, well, another question I had, um, I know you're teaching a class at VCU on surrealism and film, and you've mentioned this throughout your talk, that surrealism was not just a visual uh, artistic form, it did manifest in other ways. And if anyone's seen the Man Ray exhibition, there's actually a, a theater in the middle of the exhibition showing you some surreal fi surrealistic films. Um, I was wondering if you could expand upon that, the idea that it wasn't just visual artists involved in this movement, that, that it did have other areas yeah and you know speaking not visual literature poetry especially andre breton considered poetry the the main underpinnings of surrealism and poetry would change the world the irrational surrealistic poetry would change the mindsets of the world but yeah film uh, breton totally uh saw film as uh, a, a really astounding way to present surrealism because a film or a movie can flow like a dream. Think of your dreams. They flow like movies. They aren't a single image like a painting. Uh, they, they are a movie in your mind as you're sleeping. And film, cinema can reproduce that flow or even that lack of flow, the constant transformations that go on within dreams film can come close to replicating those. Now, the, uh, fil the film showing in the exhibition is called Imak Bakia. It's um, uh, uh, Man Ray's longer movie, a extension sort of, of one he made called Return to Reason, which was uh, from 1922, right before surrealism took over from Dadaism. You can kind of say that Dada kind of crashed and burned. I mean, it was a totally negative movement, if you can even call it a movement or if you can even call it negative. It was really, I don't think they cared enough uh, really to keep it going. And um, it ate itself alive, you might say. And surrealism came up from the ashes. And so by the time uh, Man Ray made Emac Bakia and uh, two or three other films, uh, he was taking up the reins of surrealism, meaning they probably had more uh, dreamlike meanings to them, whereas Return to Reason is almost, you could call a purely Dadaist film. And so in Mach Bakia that's in, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, sorry for that, but uh, the film playing in the exhibition is sort of a transition movie from Dada to surrealism. Well, and I'm glad you bring up Dada, Trent, because there's actually a photo exhibition on view outside of a muse on the third floor that has to do with American Dada and specifically an artist by the name of John Covert. Right, Trent? Am I saying that correctly? That sounds good to me. Okay, um, and I just wanted to let everyone know as a, as a parting note, um, the curator of that exhibition, uh, Dr. Leo Mazo, who's in our American art department, uh, he will be leading a three and 30 in March on American Dada and John Covert. Uh, so with that, Trent, there are no other uh, hey, questions. Izzy, yeah. 
I want to throw one little thing in. You were mentioning yeah. the American data, which didn't uh, really coagulate real well here. And Man Ray was in New York trying to, he was one of the big uh, motivators of American data in New York City. And um, this country is one of the countries, one of the major countries that just never gave itself over. The artists never did completely understand it or surrealism it seemed some did uh, but uh, there wasn't a major movement here in Dali I mean uh, Man Ray said hey I'm heading to Paris you cannot compete Dada cannot compete with the natural Dada of New York City New York City called this totally Dada and there's no way his movement can compete with that that's going on all the time in New York City. I can kind of see that. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's something to look out for um, in that March talk. And uh, thank you, Trent, for uh, these thoughts. And I hope if you are able uh, to come visit us for the Man Ray exhibition, it is on view through the middle of February, and you can get your tickets online. And I hope to see you next month for our next 3 and 30. Thank you so much, Trent. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.